in my restless dreams, I see that town, Silent Hill. The world of Silent Hill means different things to different people. Silent Hill 2, originally released in September of 2001, was a very different animal from the original game. The setting is the same. The siren, the other world, the fog, but gone are the machinations of the cult, which we saw in number one. Gone is the objective to save a loved one. This trip through Silent Hill is personal, a journey through a hell of your own making. How you come out, or even if you come out, is up to you. Silent Hill 2 is ultimately about two things, punishment and forgiveness, or to put it another way, damnation and redemption. We are human beings, flawed, imperfect. Within all of us is the capacity for three things, greatness, evil, and forgiveness. So many people subscribe to the idea that they're all mutually exclusive. If you commit a terrible act, then that is what you are. Your single action has defined you as a person. And that can be quite a load to deal with because you can start to believe it. And those feelings swirl around in a miasma inside your head and inside your soul, swirling into this perfect vortex of self-hate and self-destruction. Maybe that causes you to commit other terrible acts. Maybe it causes you to commit self-harm or even pay the ultimate price. Or maybe... It could give you clarity on an action. It's important to know the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is the feeling over an action. Shame, they're the feelings over yourself. If you truly believe that you are the worst thing that you have ever done and that everything else in your life is a precursor to that one thing, then you strip an entire life of its validity. A good man can commit an evil act. A bad man could find himself doing some good, but if you let your single actions define you, where do you go from there? We start the game out with James Sunderland looking in a mirror, staring at himself. The melancholy music overtakes us and we see exactly where we are. Through James, we have come to Silent Hill. But why? James is here because he received a letter from his dead wife, Mary. We're just along for the ride. We get to experience vicariously the torment that James goes through in pursuit of his wife and learn the truth about her death. Mary was suffering from a very aggressive terminal illness. In her final days, she turned mean, vicious, berating him as a person, berating him as a man, but it wasn't the illness that killed her. And that is why James is in Silent Hill. James is here because he repressed what happened to Mary. He repressed the truth. It was James. James smothered his wife with a pillow. But to what end? Was it to stop her pain and misery? To release his love from the torturous purgatory that she lived in? From an existence where she had stopped being herself? Or did he do it for himself? Was it to stop his own suffering? Euthanasia or murder? But did James... Is there even a difference? Does the truth even matter? He takes responsibility for both of these possibilities. He confesses that he did it because he loved her. I told you that I wanted to die, James. I wanted the pain to end. That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. <laughs> but then... No. That's not the whole truth. You also said that you didn't want to die. 
The truth is, part of me hated you for taking away my life. But if that was true, then why is he here? Even if James hated Mary at the end for who the sickness was turning her into, he never stopped loving her. And his guilt and shame took on many forms before he finally repressed the truth about what happened. But repression doesn't mean that it's gone. There will always be an echo of what you have done left behind. Mary said she wanted to die, but also that she didn't. Couldn't both be true? The end was coming regardless. She didn't have to want it. Maybe she wanted to go before her disease twisted her into something that would forever ruin her memory. And the same could be said for James. He wanted to save her from her pain, but also wanted to save himself. Can't both of these things be true at the same time? What makes this game so damn terrifying is the emphasis on the psychological aspect of the psychological horror. This game is rife with metaphors and symbolism, from enemies to environments, and to understand it truly, we should take a look at the philosophies of Carl Jung. Carl Jung was a Swiss psychoanalyst who studied under Sigmund Freud and gave a very interesting definition to the word libido. Now, typically, we know the term libido to refer to, you know, sexual desires, which is extremely Freudian, and there's a lot of that in this game. But Jung takes it a step further. He postures that libido denotes a desire or impulse unchecked by any sort of authority, moral or otherwise. Libido is appetite in its natural state. Now, think of the wording of that and what it truly means. Appetite in its natural state. Sexual appetite, sure. Absolutely. But what about the hunger and the drive to punish? Punish a loved one, punish society, punish authority, punish yourself. Your unchecked need for self-flagellation, your need for penance. The enemies that we meet along the way in this game are representative of James' own subconscious in that exact way. Simultaneous representations of sexuality in many cases, as well as their hostility toward him, feeding that need for punishment. Let's look at the leg mannequins, representing his lust and desire. With his wife in the condition that she was in, with no sexual release, sex overtakes his thoughts, and what we get is a representation of his desire. In this particular case, not a person, but an object. Legs and sex organs. Not living, but animated. An impersonal sex doll for him to get off, but without the human condition attached. That's one theory. Another is maybe James strayed. Maybe he got a prostitute or had a hookup at a bar with no goal in mind but sexual gratification. The other person meant nothing to him. They were as if they weren't even a person, but a means to his own ends. Whatever the case may be as to what, we know this. It haunts him. It torments him. It kicks at him and it hurts him. It punishes him. The nurses, faceless, in an over-sexualized costume. Nurses like the ones who cared for his wife in the hospital, a symbol of care and healing perverted into a twisted form to inflict pain and torment. His sexuality again coming to torment him. And these enemies are even more difficult to fight off because of their close proximity to the true nature of his torment, his feelings over his wife. We meet Maria. In many ways, a carbon copy of Mary, physically identical in every detail, however, dressed and acting much more sexually and flirtatious. So not a true copy of Mary, but more of what James may have wanted Mary to be. So unlike the memories that he clings to of Mary, she isn't sweet. She mocks him and again torments him, like Mary did at the end. She's not Mary, but a dark double, a twisted version, and someone that serves to torture James in a very different way, by being killed over. <laughs> and over again, forcing James in many ways to relive Mary's death. But before we can talk about that, we need to discuss one of, if not the most recognizable figure in not only all of Silent Hill, but in video games in general, Pyramid Head or 
in this game, the Red Pyramid, an imposing figure, both hands bound, and with what seems to be an extremely uncomfortable apparatus on its head. Its weapons are phallic in nature, using both a spear and a giant butcher knife to stab and penetrate. Sure, that's Freudian, but I'm not bringing that up to talk about it sexually, although a lot could be discussed here. I mean, hell, the first time we see him, he's raping one of the mannequins. In this case, though, I'm referring to masculinity. Toxic masculinity. The type of masculinity that society tells you that you should always strive to achieve, suppressing thoughts, suppressing feelings, and emotions to that goal. The type of masculinity that ultimately becomes self-defeating. You learn throughout your many encounters in this game that you can't kill Pyramid Head. Fight it. Sure. That's the goal in many cases. Run out the clock or do as much damage as you can, but James does not actually kill it. It's only at the end when he realizes what Pyramid Head is and what it truly represents that it is defeated by impaling itself. Pyramid Head is James. Or to be more precise, Pyramid Head is a physical manifestation of James's unchecked desire and appetite to punish himself for what he did to Mary. It's his need for punishment made flesh. Unchecked pure appetite for your own destruction. Not guilt, no. No, we've gone past that. We're into shame now. The feelings about who and what you are. Because he is the one responsible for her death, not the illness. The final boss is ultimately a representation of that. A bedridden Mary, or Maria, depending on how you play the game, looms over your head attacking you. The memory, always hanging over your head. James isn't the only person in this town either, and arguably not even the most tragic. We have the ever-bullied Eddie, who is drawn into the town. The implication with him is that he's going through his own hell right beside James, dealing with his own libidic urges. In this case, murderous vengeance for how he's been treated. But he sees only his reality, not James's, and vice versa. All of the characters see their own version of the town. Well, almost all. Angela is the character that haunts me. Again, drawn to Silent Hill out of an unchecked appetite for punishment. But punishment for what? We learn through our interactions with her that she came from a physically and sexually abusive family. And we not only learn this from her dialogue, but eventually from James' own experiences right alongside her. I believe that it's James's compassion and need to reach out to try to form some bond that brought her hell into his own, mixing her hell with his hell. We can see the openings with the fleshy protrusions moving in and out, and then we see and ultimately have to face down Angela's oppressor, her own personal version of Pyramid Head, the Abstract Daddy, a monster in the shape of a bed with a wriggling, fleshy mass in the middle that almost looks like bodies moving underneath the covers. I think it's rather clear what the metaphor is here, right? I mean, do I even need to say it? After a life of abuse, Angela fought back by lighting a fire, burning her house down and killing her father in his own bed. And she's here in Silent Hill with us. Why? Because of her guilt for killing him? Because of her shame? The feeling that she's a murderer? Or is it something deeper than that? We're going to return to Angela and Eddie and James and Mary and Maria in a future episode, but think on that. Reflect on that. Why is Angela here? A girl that fought back. A girl that liberated herself. And she's in hell with us. Punishment. Damnation. Torment. That's what Silent Hill has represented to us so far. That's what it represents to James and to Eddie and to Angela. But that libido keeps gnawing. It keeps screaming out. It keeps craving. But what? What does it keep craving? Forgiveness. And that's one of the other themes of this game. Forgiveness. Or lack thereof. And that's what each ending represents. Forgiveness or lack thereof. Forgiveness or lack thereof.
Do you really think I could ever forgive you for what you did? In the book of Matthew, Jesus says seven times seventy-seven is how many times you're supposed to forgive your brother. Some guy cuts you off in traffic and causes you to total your car. Somebody spreads rumors about you, causing you to question your own self-worth. Somebody in a fit of rage decides to slash your tires or come after you physically. Meanwhile, an innocent man is nailed to a cross with iron spikes and with his dying breath shouts out, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Kind of raises the bar for the rest of us, doesn't it? James is not only on a quest for punishment, but for atonement, for forgiveness for his sins, for how he felt for his desires, for being human, for his own internal struggling while going through the hardest thing he has ever had to deal with, in no small part because of the last thing Mary will ever deal with. A wise man once said, life is an adventure in forgiveness. And this game is absolutely a representation of that. You may think that quote is hokey and cliche, but think about the risks. You could climb to Shady Brook Hotel, fighting your way through creatures and demons just to be struck down by Mary, who refuses to forgive. Think about the rewards. To say your goodbye. To reunite. To start over. Or you could just ignore it. In one ending, James leaves with Maria, then you hear her cough, implying that the entire cycle that we've just gone through will start all over again. James killing Maria and going right back into Silent Hill. Another ending shows James leaving Silent Hill as Mary reads him a final letter, forgiving him. There's one ending with James leaving to begin a ritual to resurrect Mary. A UFO ending is in there as well, and there's also one with a dog. Look, out of all of the endings, for any of the characters, there is only one ending that gives us forgiveness. So why don't we do it more? And I'm not just talking about the game, I'm also talking about us. If forgiveness is so important, then why don't we do it more? There are two reasons why we hold back from forgiving. One is accountability. As long as you're still in pain, as long as you're still hurting, as long as you're still angry, you need someone to blame. You need somewhere for that, for those feelings to go. What are you going to do with all of those emotions if you let the bastard off the hook? The second one is far more insidious. The second reason, identity. Without all of that pain, without all of that sorrow, without all of that rage, who am I? The most difficult person to forgive though? Yourself. (laughs) The darkness inside you, it laughs at the concept. When you forgive someone else, they're not likely to shoot you down. If Mary forgave James in every ending of the game, do you think that he'd sit there and go, fuck that? Forgiving yourself, though? It's fuck that all the time. No matter what it's for, a year goes by, you still can't let it go. Another year, and it's still twisting and writhing inside you. Mary died three years ago, and James is still tormented. Another year goes by. Five, ten, twenty. Look at Angela. That shame that she's drowning in being a victim of abuse for so long, even with her tormentor long dead, she still walks into the burning building to emulate, possibly for eternity, all because she can't forgive herself. Not even for killing her father, no, but forgive herself and alleviate the shame placed on people that suffer from that kind of abuse. Shame and guilt given to them by their tormentors. In one ending, James drives his car straight into Toluca Lake, killing himself. He got past his need for punishment, but he couldn't take that final step. Are you really going to take that grudge against yourself to the grave? Are you going to carry it for eternity? What about us, though? What about you? What about me? 
A girl stands in a cemetery, reading a letter she wrote to her long-dead mother, finally forgiving her for all of the terrible things that she did when she was a child. A man cheats on his wife, and that wife is wrecked with feelings of inadequacy and retaliation. The mother of a murder victim has fantasies of vengeance. You say to the person in the mirror, you're done hating yourself. But inside you're laughing because you know you're not. Lots of people try to say forgive and forget. Lots of other people don't even know what forgiveness really is. They think that forgiveness is about the other person. That as soon as you do that act, you let the other person off the hook. That you're supposed to go have a drink with that person. That your feelings are no longer valid. But forgiveness is not about them. It's always about you. Forgiveness is about yourself and letting that baggage go so that it doesn't consume you. So forgive and forget, I say fuck that. I say forgive and remember. Remember that every day you may have to wake up and do it all over again. You may have to learn to forgive all over again. Forgive another person, forgive yourself. Say it every single day like a mantra. Forgive. You deserve to die too, James. Forgive. It'd be easier if they'd just kill me. But I guess the hospital's making a nice profit off me. They want to keep me alive. Are you still here? I told you to go. Are you deaf? Don't come back. Forgive. Forgive me. I can't. You can. Forgive. I deserved what happened. No, Angela. That's wrong. Forgive. From now on, if anyone makes fun of me, I'll kill him. Forgive. Do you really think I could ever forgive you for what you did? Forgive. You killed me, and you're suffering for it. It's enough, James. You can. You can. Forgive.